Good morning. I have to say it. How about them bills? <laughs> after, after 25 years in the wilderness of uh, no playoff wins. It's just good to see joy, isn't it? And uh, for those of you who stayed up late and watched the game, I appreciate your loyalty and a nap is in your future. And, uh, and if you want to take it during the sermon, that's okay. Um, before I move into uh, the message, I want to pray for you today, those who are in this room and those who are watching online. Um, our culture is saturated, it's inundated. Honestly, it's drowning in some things that I really do believe the only solution is Jesus. As much as we wish and hope and try for human endeavors to bring about the things that our hearts desire and our hopes contend for at the end of the day, it's Jesus that makes the difference. So would you just bow with me this morning? Let's pray. Uh, Father, there are so many things, so very many things to be afraid of. And there are so many ways that our fear is shown. But our fear reveals that our hope, that the source of our confidence is in something or someone besides you. I'm not just asking that you make us calm today. I'm asking that you make us brave today. Help us turn from fleeing to facing the things that generate anxiety in our lives. Use our voices and our actions to bring a quiet confidence in every place we go because you are with us. In Jesus' name, amen. We're in a series called uh, I'm Struggling, and the first message was I'm Struggling with My Family, and the second message was I'm Struggling with Isolation, and today's message is I'm Struggling with God, and some people wondered if this message was planned because I anticipated the Bills were going to lose the game, and, and the answer is no. And somebody came in this morning to my office and asked me if I was changing my message. And I said, yes, it's, it's going to be, I used to struggle with God, but all of that's behind me now. The, the truth is you're going to face things that cause you to consider questions and solutions that really are unsettling at every part of our life and we do start turning from um, a kind of hopeful anticipation to a fearful anticipation. And so I'd like to turn to an example of how the one who showed us best in scripture how to process something like this does that. And it's in Mark chapter 14, beginning in verse 32. They went to a place called Gethsemane and Jesus said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. And he took Peter, James, and John along with him, and he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death, he said to them. Stay here. Keep watch. Going a little further, he fell to the ground and prayed that if it's possible, the hour might pass from him. Abba, Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me. Yet, not what I will, but what you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Simon, he said to Peter, are you asleep? Couldn't you keep watch for one hour? Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Once more, he went away and prayed the same thing. And when he came back, he found them again sleeping because their eyes were heavy. They did not know 
what to say to him. Returning the third time, he said to them, are you still sleeping and resting? Enough, the hour has come. Look, the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. When we begin a spiritual journey, there's a kind of inspiring, exciting reality of, of becoming aware of God, who he is and what he's about in our world. And it's interesting to begin to learn the path of following Jesus and, and the kind of disciplines that reorient our life to something that's future and something that's hopeful. And it's exhilarating to begin to find ways to serve, to see your purpose lived out in our world. But inevitably, inevitably, we all wind up facing something that is hard and it's heavy and it hurts. There are no exceptions to that. Maybe you haven't had to deal with much of that in your life, but it's very unlikely you get through very many days in this world without having to contend with these things. Everyone experiences pain. So where does this pain come from? Sometimes it's caused by others, how they treat us or what they take from us or what they impose on us. And we've all had experiences where someone did something or failed to do something that caused us a great deal of pain in our lives. We can also experience pain from unfortunate circumstances, just being in the wrong place at the wrong time. Somebody says, I don't believe that's possible. Everything's been planned. Well, let me, let me just try a little passage of scripture from the wisest person who ever lived in the Old Testament. And his name was Solomon. And this is what he says in Ecclesiastes 9. I have seen something else under the sun. The race is not to the swift or the battle to the strong, nor does food come to the wise or wealth to the brilliant or favor to the learned. But time and chance happen to them all. Moreover, no one knows when their hour will come. As fish are caught in a cruel net or birds are taken in a snare, so people are trapped by evil times that fall unexpectedly on them. We live in a broken world. This is not heaven, even if the Bills won a game. <laughs> it's not heaven. And stuff happens here that won't happen there. And then there's another source of pain, and that's our own personal sin. Sometimes our actions are, are motivated by selfishness. Sometimes it's motivated by impatience. Sometimes it's motivated by ignorance. I know that there are lots of people who think, well, if I do something that's, that's not good, but I didn't do it on purpose, there shouldn't be any penalty for that. Well, if you jump off a cliff or you fall off a cliff, the outcome is exactly the same. It doesn't matter what your intention was. Gravity is a very real force. It's a law of nature. And the laws of God are the things that keep us grounded in our world. And when we break them, whether intentionally or unintentionally, there are real painful realities that we have to contend with as a result of that. And here's the challenge. We are not perfect and we cannot surround ourselves with perfect people, and we cannot control everything that happens in our lives. Scripture does not hide this fact from us. It doesn't mean that we want to hear it or that we understand it when someone tells us. The truth is we'd rather avoid pain if we can. If we do experience pain, we want it to be resolved really quickly. If it's going to cost us something, we want that cost to be as little as possible. But I do think that I have observed among people this truth, and that is we are willing to endure pain if we can find meaning. If there's some purpose, if there's some reason, if there's some objective that's worthwhile, we're willing to go through something. We're willing to go through some discomfort if something or someone matters a lot to us. Now, most of the pain in our life is actually not caused by God. I know that there are people who will constantly tell us that, that if something goes wrong in your life, that this is the judgment of God. Um, he doesn't cause the pain. I can also tell you he's not surprised by the pain. I can tell you that in the midst of that pain, he can assign a purpose to it where he can redeem it. I can tell you that he has a plan to get you through it. 
The meaning that we're most likely to assign to our pain is that God is punishing us for something we said or did not say or something we did or did not do. But God actually has a real purpose that he can assign in the midst of a painful reality. And he can redeem what it is we're going through and get us through it. So a crisis can break into our lives and turn our whole world upside down. It comes in lots of forms. Maybe it's the death of someone that you love. Maybe it's the loss of a job. And now your capacity to support yourself and others is upended. Maybe it's the loss of a friend. You're confused as to why the distance has been created. Maybe it's a diagnosis. And the words that you most feared are the ones the doctor is saying to you right now. Maybe it's a divorce, a person you thought you would spend the rest of your life with. Now it looks like something else is going to happen. Betrayal. Someone that you put a lot of trust and confidence in acted in ways you couldn't possibly have calculated. Maybe it's your child making some really unhealthy choices. That'll strike fear into the heart of any parent. An accident. Infertility. Desire to be married, and it seems like that's never going to happen. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. There's so many ways that a crisis can break into our lives. And sometimes we assume, if I had enough faith, then that would not have happened. If I had enough faith, I wouldn't have to go through these situations. Scripture reveals to us that faith is not so much an attempt to avoid the painful realities of life. Faith is the way we get through the painful realities of life. We worry sometimes that if we confess that there are things that we're afraid of, or we confess that we're frustrated, that somehow we'll limit God. Like God is up in heaven saying, oh, if they just hadn't said that, then I'd be able to do something. It's not a sin to acknowledge that, that you're confused. It's not a sin to acknowledge that you don't understand what God is doing right now. It's not a sin to acknowledge that you're hurt or you're angry or you're sad or you feel alone. That is not a sin to acknowledge that. Sometimes when we go through these things, we have all these emotions and, and we, we get frustrated by them, but there's another thing that happens and that's the absence of emotions and other things we used to enjoy. For example, maybe you used to feel really inspired when you, you read scripture and now because you're going through a crisis, you, you read scripture and it just, it feels like just words on a page, a hollow echo in your soul. Or maybe you used to worship and, and you felt your spirit soar when you lifted your hands and your voice unto God and now you try doing those things and it just feels like your praise barely gets out of your mouth and falls to the floor. Or maybe when you were praying, you used to sense some kind of confidence that heaven was listening and actively engaged in trying to do something and now your prayers feel as though you're just, you're talking to thin air or against a hard surface and it just echoes back to you. Throughout the course of Christian history, there's a reference that keeps showing up from people who've experienced some things. There's a term that they've assigned to this. It's very common. It's called a dark night of the soul. And that's what people describe this kind of season as. But this is also when we discover that God is more than our feelings. God is more than our feelings. This passage actually revealed the most astonishing thing, that God experienced this dark night of the soul too. Did you catch the words of Jesus or are we so familiar with them we let them roll over us without latching onto them? My soul is overwhelmed, he said, overwhelmed with sorrow, he said, to the point of death. These are the words of Jesus. Stay here, keep watch. What's he saying? I can't be alone and you guys need to be watching out for me right now. Listen to his prayer. Everything is possible for you, Father. Everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me. We know Jesus did not sin by praying such prayers. Therefore, we are not sinning 
by praying such prayers. In seasons of suffering, there's, there's things that, that we learn, and there are things that tend to get stronger in us. For one thing is that in a season of suffering, we learn to strengthen our endurance. Our endurance. Our impatience can rob us of a lot of good things in life. We just give up and walk away. Staying engaged, staying faithful. These position us for the, the wonderful things that God has for our life. But it requires a patient endurance. Now, I will be the first to acknowledge there are some things that are not in your control. Other people will make choices, and there's nothing you can really do about that. And I don't want you to beat yourself up about that. But there are some struggles that we must learn to endure. Um, does, does anybody in this room ever get bored? Anybody bored right now? And it's so easy to turn our attention away when we're bored, to give up when we're bored. If we can't endure when we're bored, what are we going to do when we're in a crisis? Listen to what it says in Romans, the fifth chapter. We glory in our sufferings. Why would he use that kind of language? Because we know that suffering produces perseverance. I'm able to develop greater stamina when I go through harder things. He goes on and he talks about character in this too. He says, and perseverance produces character. This is another thing that gets strengthened when we're going through painful trials, our character. And, and character is, there, sometimes there are things in our life that need to be pruned. You know, if, if you're good with plants, I'm not. But if you are good with plants, there are certain plants that as they grow, you want to prune them. And it's not as though any part of the plant is bad. It's that, that in order for that plant to produce its greatest fruitfulness or beauty, that some of that life has to be directed towards the thing that matters the most. And so pruning has to occur. What needs to be pruned for my life? Or what should be added and included to my life that would actually strengthen and develop my character? I'm in a crisis, sometimes we figure some of this stuff out that we never thought about before. And then we can also strengthen our connection to others. You know, we allow our crises to separate us from others when in fact it can be the most remarkable time to connect with others. Look at what it says in 2 Corinthians, the first chapter. The God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles. Please hear that. He comforts us in all our troubles our troubles, so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. When you're trying to connect with others, if, if you haven't been through what they've been through, I'm going to give a little piece of advice. Don't try to find a cliche that you think is going to make them feel better. It almost never does. And by the way, it's not helpful when you've not been anything through anything like that. And, and, and you look at them and you say, well, I know what you're going through. Um, that's unlikely. Well, I don't know what to say. I'm, I'm going to give you a, a recommendation for what to say with someone you care about who's going through suffering and, and you don't have that experience. All right? here's, here's the recommendation. Here's the advice. Ask questions, don't make statements. Ask them how they feel. Ask them what you can do to help. Questions are better than statements, especially when we don't have experience in what they're going through. And if you do have experience, cliches don't help then either. What you do, do discover is that when you have experience in something like that, you have greater stamina to stay connected to that person in the midst of their suffering. If you've not been through things like that, the tendency is to want to withdraw. We don't know what to say, so then we don't want to be around. Uh, people who have experienced cancer diagnosis almost unilaterally acknowledge this. As soon as they tell people that they care about that they have cancer, it, it's just amazing how much distance gets created. And it's not because those people stop caring. It's just that those people don't know what to say anymore. 
But if you've been through a cancer diagnosis and someone you care about has been through that, you don't have to say a lot of things. You're just not afraid to be with them in the midst of it. It's a very powerful thing. So the question is, what kind of prayers can I pray when I'm going through these kinds of painful experiences in life? And the first thing I would tell you is pray honest prayers. Pray honest prayers. You don't have to pretend anything. Jesus insists that we never do anything outside of truth. Tell the truth. Be honest in your prayers. Tell God how you feel. Tell God what you are afraid of. That is not an absence of faith. Secondly, pray bold prayers. It's not wrong to ask for miracles. It's not wrong to ask for divine intervention. Jesus prayed this way. By the way, his prayer wasn't answered. Father, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me. Nothing's impossible to you. You are able to do this. Take this cup from me. Honest and bold prayers are not sinful. God's not offended by them. But there's a third prayer we can pray. And that's what I call open door prayers. I will drink this cup. I will endure this hour. I will walk through this valley. I will brave this darkness if you want me to. If you have a purpose that you can assign to this, if you have a way to add value and meaning in my life or to those around me, then I will embrace the trial if you want me to. This prayer is not a lesser faith prayer. It's a greater faith prayer. Why is this prayer necessary sometimes? Because there are things in our world that will not change for the better if all we do is seek our own comfort and avoid pain. That's what's true. There are burdens that will never be lifted. There are precious people who will never be rescued if all we do is take the safe and easy option. Darkness cannot win. That means that we must be willing to bring light into places we would rather avoid. This is what Jesus did for us. Now, I came across a poem this week. I'm not much of a poetry guy, but this one caught my attention. It's not the whole poem, but and it was written quite a while ago, so there's words like thou, which means you, and uh, didst, which means did. The other gods were strong, but thou wast weak. They rode, but thou didst stumble to a throne. But to our wounds, only God's wounds can speak. And not a God has wounds, but thou alone. He's been where we are. He knows how we feel. He has something to say. Let's bow our heads this morning. I, I don't know um, what prayer you need to pray today. Maybe you need to find a quiet space where you are just honest with God. You've been hiding your feelings from him, from others, maybe even from yourself. And so maybe that's the prayer where you just acknowledge, this is way harder than I thought, and I don't know if I have the strength to get through. There were things that I hoped for and fought for, and they seem further away and maybe impossible now. I thought I was the kind of person that was strong and could take almost anything, and now I feel like I'm fragile and can't survive anything. That's an honest prayer. That's a good conversation to have with God. Or maybe you need to pray a bold prayer 
Maybe you have so long endured the disappointment of a desire that has not yet come into your life, that you've either lost courage or interest in calling heaven to intervene and make a difference. God is not offended by the bold prayers. You cannot imagine a prayer that's bigger than the God who hears and can answer. And maybe for some of you today, you need to step back into the kind of prayer that shakes the foundations of earth while it intercedes to heaven. And then there are some that maybe what you need to do today is to pray the open door prayer that escape, if exercised, will leave others in darkness and in pain, in isolation and without hope. And if you're willing to walk a little further, if you're willing to carry the burden a little bit longer, that their life will be benefited in ways they will never have words to describe and you can't possibly imagine. I know, times are hard, fear is high, hope is often gone, but God is here in the midst of all of it with us. If we're willing to pray, honest prayers and bold prayers and open door prayers. So Father, hear our prayers. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand together.